Okay, we start again and uh, we are going to talk about um, pointers again very quickly. You should uh, already know what a pointer is. And, uh, but let's have a little bit of recalling. Okay, so a pointer is basically a variable that can hold a memory address. So it's like any other variable, but instead of holding uh, a normal uh, value, it holds an address in memory. And uh, so, for example, here you have uh, two integer variables, and then you have uh, p, which is uh, a pointer in memory uh, to an integer. Okay, so th this is the basic syntax integer, then a star, and then p. Okay, and uh, you can uh, take obtain the address of a variable by using this uh, ampersand okay this is simple in Italian this is echo merciale in English it's ampersand so p equal uh, ampersand a means that p gets the address of a okay and of course you can print this address and you will obtain uh, usually an hexadecimal address okay and you can dereference uh, the value. That means instead of printing the address, I want to obtain the value in the location uh, at the address contained in P. So P has an address, we go to that address and we take the value, okay? And that value is going to be an integer, we know, because this is a pointer to integer, okay? And we can use that uh, writing star P also to the left of an assignment so star p equal to six means that in the address pointed by p we write value six so now variable a is equal to six with this and uh, we can also change the value of the address now p points to b and we can now print the value of b which is seven okay uh, so pointers are very powerful because it uh, they allow you to do whatever you want basically because uh, by address by uh, having access to the raw memory you can do whatever you want and uh, there is an equivalence between array and pointers in the sense that the name of array is equivalent to a constant pointer to the first element in the array okay so, for example, I have here an array of characters name with my, which, with my name. And if I do cout star name, as I said, the name is also the pointer to the first element of the array. So, cout star name will print G. Okay? And, of course, I can define also a pointer P that points... To the first element of the array like that and what I can do then is to uh, increment this pointer incrementing a pointer is equivalent to moving to the next location in memory okay so this uh, P now will point to I the second character in the array okay and this assertion is correct because, in effect, now P points to the second element in the array, so to name plus one, okay? And we can print the rest of the array by doing like this. So basically, until we reach the last element of the array, which is character zero, every string is always terminated by a zero, then we just increment we, we just take the P, the element pointed by P, and we print it, and then we increment the pointer, okay? Uh, so it just prints the content of the address pointed by P and increments it until the end of the array. Okay, so what pointers are for? For a lot of different things, you know. and uh, But very often in C++, they are used for pointing to objects that have been allocated dynamically, okay? So dynamic memory in C, uh, there are two functions uh, from the standard library. 
uh, malloc and free that you use for allocating and deallocating memory from the heap. Okay, they both take pointers to any type. So malloc we take uh, uh, the sides of the memory to allocate and we return a pointer to void. And the free will take a pointer to void. And this means that it's the responsibility of the programmer to make sure that it's uh, correctly using malloc and free. And actually this is one of the uh, most difficult part of programming in C is to make sure that dynamic memory is allocated and deallocated correctly. Okay. In C++, instead of malloc and free, you use two different keywords. And actually they are operators. And oper you use operator new and to deallocate you use operator delete. And they are more type safe because new is going to look at the type of the object you are going to uh, create and delete is going to look at the type of the object you want to destroy. Uh, new and delete can be applied to primitive types so you can allocate memory for integers or to classes. Okay. And this new operator automatically calculates the size of the memory to be allocated. So the, it's also safer for this reason because the uh, calculation is done more or less automatically. So here, new int 5, it creates a memory for one integer and initialize this integer to 5, to value 5. And the address of this integer is stored into P. And then uh, you have a class here. And then if you do new A, this is actually two different operations. First, it allocates memory for an object of class A. So it calculates the sides of A and allocates memory on the heap for an object of type A. And then it calls the constructor of A on that memory for uh, initializing the object. The address of the memory is uh, uh, of the memory block is returned by new and in this case is assigned to pointer Q, which is a pointer to an object of type A. And if we want to deallocate, we just write delete P and delete Q and delete Q in particular does two things. First, it calls a function called destructor for class A and then it deallocates the memory point by Q. So now let's see what is this destructor. So the destructor is just the dual, the inverse of the constructor. The constructor is used to initialize the object. The destructor is used for cleanup. Okay? So destructor and constructor are always defined for all objects. Okay? If you don't define them, the compiler is going to create standard ones for you. Okay? And uh, the syntax for the destructor is that you have to put this uh, symbol here, tilde, in front of the name of the class, and then here you write the code for the destructor. The destructor, of course, never takes uh, any parameter. Okay? There is no need to pass parameter to the destructor. And here is the example. Okay, so uh, basically uh, I'm declaring a, a, func a class A, which has one single uh, variable A, and I have a constructor and uh, that takes uh, an integer and uh, uh, initializes the internal variable with this integer and then prints constructor on the screen. And I have the destructor, which uh, basically tells us that we are destroying this uh, object. And here, what I do is a function that returns a pointer to an object of type A. And this function creates a local object of type A. Then it creates dynamically an object of type the A initialized to 2 and another local object initialized to 3 and then it returns P. 
and then in the main I'm going to create yet another object of type A initialized to zero I'm calling my phone then I creating still another object of type 4 uh, initialized to 4 and then I'm deleting uh, the pointer so let's try to guess what's the order of the different printing I'm going to have uh, in my program so there are no global variables so the first thing is to execute the main and so the first thing is going to be printed is in the main then the constructor of this object is called so the constructor is this function so it will print constructor with a equal to zero then my function is called so we go inside my function and we print inside my function then constructor of a is called and this will print constructor with a equal to one then another constructor is called and then yet another constructor is called so this will print one two and three then we return at this point this function is finished as terminated so we have to deallocate the object on the stack so what is going to happen is that the structure of this two object is going to be called and in particular the order is going to be the reverse order with respect to the creation so this is going to, to call uh, the structure of three and the structure of one the structure of two is not called because this object is created on the heap so its lifetime is longer than the local variables here then again in the main is printed on the screen object 4 is created then I delete P so I'm going to delete this object here so I'm going to print the structure with A equal to 2 and finally the main is over and so the destructor of 4 and the destructor of 0 are going to be called let's see if everything is correct So in the main, constructor with 0, then constructor with 1, 2, 3, then 3 and 1 are destroyed, I return inside the main, I construct object with a equal to 4, then I destruct the one that I dynamically allocated here with delete, and then I destroy 4 and 0 in the reverse order in which they have been created okay so this should show you when the destructor is called the destructor is called either when I do delete explicitly delete an object that has been allocated dynamically with new or when an object has, that has been created on the stack goes uh, uh, out of his lifetime so it finishes his lifetime so in this case x and y are destroyed when function my fun returns why we need a destructor until now destructor has done nothing but printing something on the screen well a destructor is useful when an object internally dynamically allocates memory in this way when I delete the object I also delete the dynamically created object so for example in this case I have a class A then I have a class B which internally defines a pointer to A and for example in the constructor a is created and its address is assigned to P well we need to write a destructor to delete this object when B goes out of scope otherwise 
some memory could remain allocated and cannot be deleted anymore in the future okay so we need to take care of the objects that are dynamically allocated and manually deallocate them when they are not needed anymore if we don't write this instructor here the compiler will generate one automatically which does nothing and this means that if we if this memory is not deallocated properly when an object of type b goes out of scope we actually uh, lose the reference to this memory and so we have what is called a memory leak okay so to avoid memory leaks always remember to deallocate objects that you allocated during your lifetime actually this way of programming is quite bad and in the rest of uh, the course in this course i hope to convince you to try to avoid this uh, way of programming and to use instead some library functions uh, uh, programming techniques that will help you uh, avoid memory leak problems like this okay so remember that you have to deallocate things and in this course we will study techniques for automatically delete things like that when they go out of scope okay so let's write a very simple piece of code in which we show what's going on Suppose we forget to, to write this destructor, we just initialize P using the initialization list to a new object of type A that uses, uh, uh, it, that's initialized to 7, for example. Okay? I'm going to write it down here. Okay? And now suppose that in the my function, we also create an object of type B. Okay. What happens is that unfortunately we will see constructor with A equal to 7, but we'll not see the structure with A equal to 7. So see here you see constructor with a equal to 7 but you don't see the structure with a equal to 7 because we never really deallocated them so to force the allocation what we have to do is to write a destructor which takes care of deleting Okay, so we compile, and now we have the structure with A equal to 7 just before going out of uh, the main function, now the uh, my phone, okay? And actually, it's at the time of this, the destroying B, we also destroy A, okay? We can use new also for allocating an array of uh, variables or an array of objects, okay? For example, here we uh, create an array of uh, five integers. We use a square parenthesis here, and this will allocate an array of five integers, okay? And these five integers are usually 
I don't remember actually what happens with pre pre uh, primitive types. I have to admit I don't remember. Maybe we should try something. But um, it should initialize all these integers to zero, if I remember well. Uh, and when I want to delete an array, I have to use a special syntax. I have to say delete, then this is square parenthesis, and then p, which is points to an array. So I have to, to tell the delete operator that I'm going to delete an array of elements and not just one single object. Uh, and I do the same with the classes, of course, exactly the same, okay? Uh, notice that in the second case, for sure, the constructor of A is called for every single object is created, okay? And this means that you need to have a, a constructor with no arguments because you cannot pass arguments to these constructors here, okay? So you need to have a default constructor which takes no argument for constructing A, otherwise this will give you an error. Hmm? And delete is just the same. You just delete an array of objects of type A. The address 0 is not valid address. And this is the same as C. So no data and no function can be located at 0. So therefore, in C++, a pointer to 0 is usually called a null pointer, which means a pointer that points to nothing. Okay? The referencing a null pointer is always an error, a very bad error actually, and is a so-called null pointer exception or more generally a segmentation fault. In C, you actually use the macro null to say zero or a pointer to zero. The problem with using a macro is that zero has no type, so it can be an integer, it can be a null pointer, it can be anything. In C++, they try to solve this uh, uh, problem of typing by using a, a specific constant, which is called null pointer, uh, which indicates a null pointer and uh, cannot be automatically converted to an integer. Okay, So it, this will catch a little bit of uh, errors sometimes uh, because uh, it's not possible to convert zero in the sense of a null pointer to zero in the sense of integer. Okay, so maybe you, you already noticed that in C++ uh, you can have several functions with the same name also in the same class. And this happens because you can do what is called function overloading. So in C++ the argument list is part of the name of the function. This means that if you have two functions with the same name but different argument list, for C++ these are actually two completely different functions. Okay? So, uh, if you look at the internal name used by the compiler for a function, it actually consists of three parts, the class name, the function name, and the argument list. So this means that the function f of class A the compiler internally will transform this in something like that. So basically it prepends some strange character, then the name of the class, then the name of the function, then the type of the argument. And if you have two arguments, this is like this, this is like that, this is like this. As you can see internally, these are all different. So for C++, these four functions are all different functions, okay? Now, be aware of the type, be very careful about these integer types here, okay? Because there are some strange rules when you want to convert from one type to another one. So let's see which one is called. Suppose you have a class A and class B. And class A defines three functions of type F, uh, of na with name F, and class B defines one single function F. And you have two objects. A and B, and we write A dot F of 5. So which function is called, of course, is the first one. Okay? And then suppose that you do B dot F of 2, and of course this is going to call this function. 
and then a dot f of 3 dot 0 well of course the last the third function of a is going to be good and then a dot f by passing two and three this takes two arguments so the second function of class a is going to be called and finally if i do a dot f of 2.53 well there is no function that takes a double in an integer inside a and so a sort of automatic conversion is going to happen 2.5 is transformed into an integer and so the second function is going to be called okay so be aware of the type uh, notice that return values are not part of the name and the compiler is not able to distinguish two functions that differ only on return values so if you have class a and you have uh, two functions floor one that returns an integer another one that runs a double this is a compilation error compile time error because the compiler is not able to distinguish these two in other words the internal name is going to be the same okay and this means that it's not possible to overload the return value and the reason is clear because this it, the compiler decides which function to call based on the argument list and not on how the return type is going to be used okay so there is no way of distinguish between these two so this is ambiguous and so it's a compilation error things gets more complicated because sometimes uh, function have long argument lists and most of these arguments don't change very often so uh, people like to set default values for arguments so c++ allows you to say that some argument if not specified has a very specific value for example here function f has two arguments a and b but if I call f by passing only one argument, then automatically the second argument takes zero. Okay, so this is equivalent to f12, zero. And of course, you can also call f with two arguments. In that case, uh, the value pass is the one that is used. Now, the combination of overloading with default arguments can be very confusing for programmers. So it's a a good idea to try to avoid as much as possible overusing overload and overusing default arguments so when you can try to reduce to the minimum the use of default arguments and the use of overloading okay so this is pretty much a very quick overview of uh, basic things next time we are going to continue the overview by talking about references and by talking about copy constructors and things like that but today i would like to start a sort of very simple exercise in particular we are going to design and use a stack of integer okay now i want to write a class that defines uh, a stack of integers okay uh, so this is going to be the interface of my class uh, I'm going to uh, define uh, a stack and I want to initialize the stack by specifying the maximum number of elements in the stack. So max size is the maximum number of things I can put on the stack. And uh, I'm going to use uh, uh, three different functions on this stack. Push to push an element. Pop to remove the element at the top. Then I'm going to use peak to just look at the top and then the sides to return the current number of elements stored inside the stack. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start it and uh, later on we are going to work a little bit on it uh, to see the different uh, way of implementing a stack. And actually, we carried on this example for uh, for much of the course. Okay, so 
I'm going to define the interface first. I leave uh, the implementation empty by now. Okay. So right now it was um, very simple, and uh, I need to complete here, and so I need to understand what to put here. So basically, uh, as a first try, I'm going to use uh, um, uh, an integer, a pointer to a, a place in memory where I'm going to store all the elements in the array. Okay, so I need to create this memory when the stack is created, and of course I need to destroy the allocate this memory when the stack is destroyed. Okay, then I'm going to use s, which is the number of elements in the stack, which is also going to be used as a, a pointer an index to the top element in the stack. Okay, so this of course needs to be initialized to zero mean that the element the array is empty and then I will always index the first free element okay now I'm going to create uh, the implementation and this is going to be in a C++ file Finally, I'm going to create uh, a main file in which I'm going to test the array. So this little project will consist of actually three files. Stack.hpp, which contains the interface, stack.cpp, which contains the implementation, and main.cpp, which contains the usage for this stack. Okay. So of course I want to create a stack, for example, with five uh, maximum five elements. Then I want to push, I don't know, a few numbers in it. Okay, so I'm pushing two elements and then I'm writing a code that uh, prints uh, the top of the stack and then pops it. And then I do this until the size is greater than zero. When the size is equal to zero, I just finish and I do. Okay, uh, let's try to compile it. We will get some error, of course, and uh, but let's see what happens. Um, 
Okay, so the first thing we do is to compile uh, stack.main.cpp to obtain a main.o. So minus c means that I'm just compiling. I don't want to link, so I don't want to obtain a, an executable file, but just an object file. Okay? So uh, the, op the output is going to be a main.o. Okay, so the first error I get is that cout was not declared in this scope. And in fact, uh, I forgot the standard specification. So actually I should write something like this. And this. Okay, because uh, otherwise it doesn't know where to find it. Okay, or alternatively, I can use uh, using namespace standard. Okay, this has compiled. So that's strange, no? It's a compiled. Has compiled because uh, what is important is the interface of stack. And the interface is respected. So I'm using stack in an appropriate way, of course. And uh, the stack, the implementation has not been done yet. Okay, so I'm not really compiling anything. And uh, let's see what happens if I compile a file stack. Also, this works okay because uh, there is no error, so everything goes okay. The problem comes when I try to link everything. So this means instead of compiling, this time I'm linking. So I pass the object files and I want to produce an example executable file. Okay? And here I see the problem. When I try to link, it doesn't find the implementation of the constructor, it doesn't find the implementation of these functions. And so basically, it cannot produce an exec file because some function is missing. So now we need to implement these functions. Okay, let's start from the uh, constructor. So I usually, what I do is I copy this here I prepend stack to all of them okay and so now I have to implement okay So this function are going to be all very easy because this is a very simple implementation. But it really highlights some of the problems. So basically the first thing I need to do is to allocate memory for this array. So this allocates an array of integers of max size integers and the pointer is a assign it to variable array, okay? Then I also initialize S to zero. And uh, as you will see, we actually will need this very soon another variable, but let's postpone this later on. When I delete, I need to delete everything. So I'm going to delete the array. When I push, what I do is I assign at location S into the array variable X and then uh, uh, when I want to pop I have to decrease S simply when I want to pick I have to return the value of array S minus 1 and sides will just return S. 
So the implementation was quite easy. And this is a simple stack. You probably have seen this already many times. So now I'm going to compile it to see if I made some mistake. <coughs> I'm compiling stack. Okay, everything worked. Now I'm linking everything. Everything works. And now I can run example. And uh, yes. You are right. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. Uh, and in fact, it was not printing anything. <laughs> and uh, OK, we compile and we run. And now I should see I have something. OK, three and two, which are the elements I pushed in the reverse order. OK, so here is it. I just push two and three, and then I pop heavy elements. Of course, this is a, was a very stupid implementation, and they, actually, I forgot one thing which is very important. Can you tell me what I did not do that is very important? So where is the problem in this program? Delete in the in the sense of what? Maybe it's not enough. They delete the the array in the 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 structure. Yeah, this deallocates the memory. But maybe it, it allocates only the array and not what is complete. But what um, what is inside the array is just integer values. And of course, uh, these are uh, deleted when I unlink uh, the block. I mean, I don't need to write zero in the array because who cares? This block is going to be reused later and probably because it's going to be overwritten by some other part of the code. So I don't really care to delete in the sense of writing zero, I guess. The, the size of Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm not checking anything here. So this is uh, very bad because if I give uh, this to a user, <laughs> he just uses it. And maybe if he makes a mistake, for example, if he tries to push too much, then uh, what is going to happen? Well, what is going to happen is probably memory corruption. So I'm going out of the boundaries of this array. And of course, uh, nobody is going to tell me anything about that. And so probably this is going to cause uh, some trouble in some part of the program in a ran very random way. In particular, let's look what happens if I write this. So I'm pushing 10 elements, but the stack only contains five. What do you think it will, will it happen? Sorry, I didn't uh, really compile main, I forget. Uh, what is it? We go then linking well <laughs> nothing is a bad word <laughs> so this is basically a, a segmentation fault and this is uh, some uh, printing about what's going on in the in the heap okay so basically the fact that i'm going outside of the boundary array was uh, 
uh, was catched by the library, the standard library, and uh, it just raised an exception. And so we have this uh, very bad uh, error here. But this is not always the case. Sometimes Sometimes you can have a very strange, uh, uh, very strange behaviors. Okay, so another core dump. It's not easy to, to obtain uh, 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 no error, but in some cases you can actually have no error. Okay, so it's going to be a very bad error. So anyway, uh, we need to to make sure that the user doesn't make any mistake like that okay so first of all we need to store this variable max side somewhere okay and uh, i'm going uh, to initialize this okay and when i push it i first make sure that s is strictly less than max size. Okay, so if s is strictly less than s max size, I do this. Otherwise, what should I do? Well, there, there must be a way to communicate the error. We have not seen exception yet, but the most uh, typical way in C++ to communicate this kind of error is to throw an exception so i'm throwing an exception which is actually an object of type string to mean that uh, I'm pushing too much. So if S is less than max size, it's okay. If it's equal to max size, I cannot do anything, okay? And uh, pop, I'm decreasing S. But if I do pop and S is zero, this is an error. So again, I have to check. If S is greater than zero, I can decrease else I have to throw an error. And peak again, if S is strictly greater than zero, then I can return an error, ah, a value. Else I have to throw an exception. And the sides, I just return the sides. And in the main, what I do is that I have to wrap everything into a tray catch. Let's try to compile. What happens that this function I'm going to be executed, and if there is an error, this will jump out of this block and go inside the catch block and print the string that has been thrown by the, the error. Okay? So let's see. Sorry, I have to compile first. Sorry, max. Oh, sorry, this is M size. Mm. 
Okay, so exception has been drawn and stuck is full is been printing on the screen because I catch the exception because I was trying to push more than allowed. Okay? Okay, for today that's it. We will continue tomorrow. If I remember well, uh, we have a lecture at 4.30, right? And uh, so for today that's it. Thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.